Let us pray. Yes, come Lord Jesus, come. May you speak to us this morning, even as we continue our meditations in the book of Acts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, we are very much uh, blessed here in Singapore uh, with much peace and stability in the midst of a harmonious society where different races and religions are able to coexist very peacefully and respectfully together. But you know, in many parts of the world, uh, that is not the case. According to its findings of the findings of the International Institute for Religious Freedom, over 360 million people around the world endured some form of persecution and discrimination in their country in uh, 2021. Uh, I found the statistics for that year, and uh, it also speaks about Christian persecution in that year. Of course, you know Christian persecution has uh, continued rising over the years, and in that year, 5,898 Christians were killed, and that was up about 24% from the previous year. 5,110 churches were attacked or closed, and that was up 14%. 6,175 Christians were arrested without trial, up 44%. And 3,829 were kidnapped, up 124% from the previous year. Now what that means is that on the average, each week, from last week when you first came to church to this week when you step into a church again, almost 100 churches somewhere in the world was attacked or closed. And around 300 Christians were either killed, arrested, or kidnapped every week. Next week, when you come again, another 100 churches would have been closed or attacked. And another 300 Christians would have been arrested, killed, or kidnapped. That's quite staggering statistics. You know, the last I checked, the top few countries where Christianity is experiencing a surge in growth numbers were places like China, India, Nigeria, and Indonesia. Interestingly, places that we often read of persecutions against Christians, but yet in these very places, Christianity is actually growing. And this is the interesting phenomenon that has characterized the church since the first century when persecution broke out against the church as recorded for us in Acts chapter 8. Luke tells us on that day when Stephen was stoned to death, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And from chapter 8 onwards, we read about how the gospel message was then proclaimed uh, in Judea and Samaria, and beyond that, the good news of salvation about Jesus Christ went out to the ends of the earth. Churches were planted wherever the disciples and the apostles went. And from a fledgling Jewish church of a few thousand believers, it became a worldwide religion 2,000 years on, with 2.4 billion followers. Uh, regardless of whatever denominations, 2.4 billion followers around the world today. That's about 30% of the world's population. How did the church grow and spread to what it is today? Now, while sociologists and church growth experts have different things to say about this, I think some of the factors are actually contained in our passage here in Acts 8. Firstly, it grew through suffering. Suffering for the sake of Christ. You know, immediately after the young church in Jerusalem had his first martyr in Stephen, Saul was one of the Pharisees then, and he stood there uh, approving the execution, and he led a great persecution against the other disciples. And it seemed to be more targeted towards the Hellenistic Greek-speaking Jews rather than the Hebraic Jews. And uh, that ex perhaps uh, explains why the apostles themselves uh, who were Hebraic Jews, managed to actually remain in Jerusalem untouched. But their Hellenistic contemporaries, people like Philip, had to flee from Jerusalem. Stephen, actually who was martyred, was also a Hellenistic Jewish, Jewish uh, believer. 
And so the Hellenistic disciples were scattered into the surrounding regions. But ironically, instead of suppressing the gospel, the gospel spread because of it. Because wherever they went, they went and they shared the gospel. Luke used this word scattered uh, three times in describing this event. And he paints this picture of a sower scattering seeds. Now in the Greek, there were a few words that uh, describe this dispersal of the disciples. But he chose to use this word, used to describe sowers when they sow seed. Right? When they go out, you know, they, they sow the seed widely so that some will land on good soil, take root and bear fruit. And I think that's the imagery that Luke wants us to see. At the same time, we remember what Jesus said in John 15. Right? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Persecution will come. But it was through the persecution that the gospel seed was sown, was scattered, was spread, and the Christian church grew and spread beyond Jerusalem. Now, a good example would be what happened in China, for example. Well, it was documented that after the Chinese Communist Party took power in 1949, it expelled all the foreign uh, missionary workers that had been there for the last 140 years. And it marked the greatest wave of missionary expulsion uh, in China's history then. And with the doors to China closed, many of the missionaries then moved into the other Asian countries, surrounding Asian countries like Hong Kong and Macau and Thailand. Some went uh, eastward to Korea and Japan. Some went south to Indonesia and, of course, Malaysia and Singapore. And that was how many of the early churches here in Singapore were established by these missionaries who were actually kicked out of China. And so, in actual fact, the whole region here benefited from the persecution that broke out uh, against the missionaries in China. Interestingly, uh, despite having all the foreign missionaries expelled out of China, um, within China itself, Christianity not only continued to grow, but it tripled in the 30 years that the doors were closed to foreign missionaries. You know, first missionaries stepped foot into China in the 1800s, and for 140 years, they only managed to grow the church to about 4 million. But in the 30 years that the doors were closed, the church tripled. Even after the official Three Self Church was established and the doors uh, reopened, persecution um, remains because of the many churches who refuse to uh, register officially with the government. And we still continue to read um, story after story of pastors who are continually being imprisoned, crosses that are being demolished, churches that are being closed. And foreigners who, continue, uh, who are still being expelled. Despite all this, the church in China grew. Today, estimates of the number of Christians there uh, is about 100 million. So my friends, do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged if and when you face persecution because of your faith. It's not because God is punishing you or, or not don't, not protecting you, but because of the hatred of the world and the evil one against those who are of Christ. Our God, who is sovereign and who has allowed this to happen, will make something good come out of it. And Jesus promised in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you because uh, on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. That leads me to my second point, that the church grows also through courage in the face of death. Courage in the face of death. When Stephen's life was being threatened by the angry crowd, he did not cower or respond in fear for his life, but instead he responded courageously. Because the scripture tells us he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked death in the eyes and he had no fear because he knew where he was going if he dies. And you know God was so gracious. 
that he gave Stephen a vision of the glory of God with Jesus at the right hand of God, assuring Stephen of God's presence with him, assuring him of his eternal destiny. And even as the story of Stephen's life came to an end, Luke introduces us to Saul there in the very first verse. Saul who stood there approving the execution of Stephen. And we know the story, right, that in the end, he, Saul was also given the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and that he would turn to Christ because of it and become one of the greatest champions and apostles of the faith. We'll come to that in a few weeks' time with, yeah, in the Acts 9 sermon. But when Stephen died, we are told in verse 2 then, devout men buried him and made great lamentation over him. No doubt, their faith and their resolve was actually made stronger in witnessing the courage that Stephen had when he faced death. He was a Tertullian, a second century church father who lived uh, in Carthage, North Africa, who was credited to say, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. He saw and went through the days where followers of the way would be captured, fed to lions, sawn in half, put to death by the sword, and also burned in fire. And yet, the more they were persecuted, the more they multiplied. And it wasn't just because they were persecuted and killed, but also the way that they faced persecution and death. The fact that all the apostles eventually were killed for their faith, uh, except for the apostle John, who apparently survived after being put in boiling water. But all the other apostles uh, were martyred. But their deaths actually served to confirm the strength of their testimony and, and the reality of this Christ that they proclaimed. Because it wasn't something that they colluded and, and um, contrived. You know, it's not a story that they made up. But it was so true and so real to them as first-hand witnesses of everything that had happened before their eyes. So much so that they would be willing to die even horrible deaths for it rather than recant their faith and to renounce Christ because it was real and true to them. Many of us would, uh, may remember the incident in, uh, 20, back in 2015 when 20 Egyptian Christians and one from Ghana was actually captured by the ISIS in Libya. They were marched to the beach, made to kneel in a line wearing orange jumpsuits. They were paraded by ISIS. They were lined up, and the soldiers then proceeded to decapitate them on video because they had refused to renounce their faith. And calmly and courageously, they died for their faith. Now, this video was intentionally made to strike fear in the hearts of the believers. But instead, it inspired faith. And people saw the power of God and the power of their faith. Archbishop Angelos, who was the bishop of the Coptic Church then, he wrote this, Where was the power? In these young men who were kneeling down so honorably and so peacefully and with such resilience and grace, or with the big men with the big swords who had to cover their faces to remain anonymous. And so it really changed their understanding of power dynamics that day. It showed that the moment of supposed weakness and brokenness, actually um, the prayer that they offered made them infinitely more powerful than those who wielded the knives. My friends, that's the kind of power in life and over death that God offers to each one of us. Because in Christ, death is not the end of the road. There is the resurrection that awaits us because of the empty tomb on Easter morning. And therefore, we can find strength to carry our crosses daily. Because we know that when we persevere in our faith, one day, God will remove it from us. So let us continue to carry our crosses daily until that day comes for us. Thirdly, in the face of persecution, the church grew through forgiving because we have been forgiven. 
You see, when Saul stood there in approval of the execution of Stephen, no doubt he, he too would have witnessed how Stephen, even while being stoned viciously, cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And that mirrors the words of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, even in the face of evil and persecution, the church did not revolt against the Jewish Sanhedrin or revolt against the Roman Empire, nor did they respond with anger and bitterness and hatred because they had learned well from Jesus. Jesus had taught on the importance of learning to forgive others. Right? In Matthew 18, on the parable of the unforgiving servant, he had taught that we are to forgive those who sin against us, not three times as the Jewish rabbis were teaching, not even seven times as Peter suggested, even though it sounded very magnanimous, right? Uh, it's um, more than the, the, what the Jewish requirement was. But instead, Jesus said 77 times. And by this, he was referencing the, the proud boast of Lamech in Genesis chapter 4, and which says that if revenge upon those who hurt Cain is sevenfold, then Le Lamech um, said that the, his revenge will be seventy-sevenfold. And he's talking about how those who hurt him will be avenged seventy-seven times over. But Jesus references that and reverses that and says that instead of avenging, we are to forgive seventy-seven times. And then he goes on to tell that parable and essentially says that we have been forgiven by our father and our master, the immense debt of our sin against him. So too, we must learn to forgive others of their sins against us. This was something that the Coptic Orthodox uh, Church knew much about. Right? Because tradition has it that Mark the Evangelist was the one who brought the gospel to Egypt and planted the church in Alexandria. He was uh, one of the Hellenist Jewish believers, perhaps who, he had to flee Jerusalem during persecution that broke out during that time. Uh, and he himself was martyred in Alexandria when those who opposed the faith tied the rope around his neck and dragged him through the city until he died. Ever since then, the Coptic church that, uh, that was planted there uh, has been very familiar with persecution. Even up to today, we still hear of news of church bombings in Egypt every now and then. After the Coptic Christians were executed at the beach in Libya that day in 2015, uh, Archbishop Angelos said that within the next 24 hours after the event, uh, he did about 35 interviews. Right? Um, different ones called upon him, uh, television, to press, to radio, and in all his sharing, he spoke a lot about forgiveness. And it resonated with the Coptic Christians. Even the families of those who were executed didn't respond with anger and bitterness. You know, there was a lot of outpour of uh, compassion towards them. Some even visited them, seeking to comfort them. But instead, what they saw were families that were described to be loving, forgiving, and resilient in, the, in those days that followed. My friends, that is the mark of the church, a people that forgives. Apparently, it was a tradition that Coptic Christians actually tattoo a, a cross on the inside of their wrists. This was something that goes way back in the, to the days of persecution when uh, the Christians were marked for their faith with this cross on their wrists to identify them as Christians in a negative way. But today, they continue to bear their mark as an act of witness and worship. They remind themselves that they are a people of the cross. And it was on that cross that Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. From persecution to propagation, through suffering, through courage in the face of death, through forgiving, and lastly, through loving, through loving your enemies. You see, after the pers persecution broke out in Jerusalem, uh, the Hellenistic dis uh, believers dispersed uh, 
uh, were scattered to various parts of the region. But Luke highlighted in verse 5 that in particular, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now that they went to many cities, but Luke highlighted this one. And this is significant because of who the Samaritans were. You see, in the eyes of the Jews, Samaritans were half-breeds and heretics. They were people from the area of Samaria after the northern kingdom uh, had fallen to the Assyrians in BC 722. The northern kingdom were the ten tribes of Israel then, but after it fell to the Assyrians, the Assyrians uh, deported many, a number of them, and they are not, uh, not really accounted for. But they were also infused with people from the region, the Canaanite nations that were living around. And Samaritans were thereafter descended from the intermarriages between the remaining Jews and those from other nations. And so the Jews don't recognize them as ethnic Jews, but see them as half-breeds in that sense, of, of a different ethnicity. Additionally, Samaritans had their own version of their Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. It was a different version from the Jewish one. They had their own temple at Mount Gerizim instead of in Jerusalem, and that's where they go to worship. Apparently, they even have their own Ark of the Covenant constructed you know, and put at Mount Gerizim where they worship. And so you can imagine why they were considered heretics by the Jews. The Samar Samaritans were held in extreme contempt by the Jews because of this, and they were considered the worst of the heathens and enemies of their faith. But yet it was specifically to these people that Philip went to proclaim to them the Christ, the good news of the Messiah. And Luke recorded that God's hand was with Philip and his testimony was confirmed with many signs and wonders that accompanied him and, and that, that happened in the Samaritan city. The Samaritans received the gospel message attentively and with joy, even as they placed their faith in Christ. The message that Luke wanted to communicate was very clear, that this message of salvation is also for the Samaritans, the worst of the heathens, even though they are looked upon as half-breed and heretics. Jesus himself, uh, you would recall, used uh, also examples of Samaritans in his parables and his various encounters with Samaritans to teach his, this point to his disciples, that they were not to discriminate against others. And so Jesus taught in Luke chapter 6, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who abuse you. You know, more easily said than done, right? Loving our enemies is not something that is natural nor instinctive for us. And it may never be because of our fallen human nature. But it is, this is something that needs to be a conscious choice for us to take. Because we ourselves were once enemies of God. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5 that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son while we were enemies of God. And so I want to end uh, today's sermon with a familiar story of Jim Elliot and his wife Elizabeth Elliot, whom I think is the true heroine actually of the story. Jim and Elizabeth, together with four other young families, went to Ecuador as missionaries to bring the gospel to a violent and isolated Alka tribe. You know, God had put into their hearts uh, that burden to take the gospel to those who have never heard. And so all these five men who went landed on that lonely jungle landing strip in 1956 and they were all killed when Alka warriors attacked them and speared them to death even before they could enter the village. They were just on the beach setting up camp there. And so they never really managed to bring the gospel to the village. But the story didn't end there. Elizabeth Elliot remained in Ecuador and continued the mission. She went on and befriended and hosted two Alka women at her home. And it was through these two women that they were invited to the village at the risk of facing that same fate that his, uh, her husband uh, faced, she took up that invitation. And eventually, she and her three-year-old daughter, Valerie, 
uh, together with Rachel Saint, who was the sister of Nate Saint, one of the men who was killed, the three of them moved into the village. And they lived there for the next two years. And it was through their ministry amongst them that many eventually came to Christ. Elizabeth herself met with the very men who speared her husband to death. And her act of love and forgiveness in choosing to forgive them played a major part in them coming to know Christ. Because through them, the Alkas experienced the love and the forgiveness of God in a very real way. You see, my friends, at the centre of the Gospel is the love and forgiveness of God in reconciling men back to himself through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. And the power of the gospel is displayed through the love and forgiveness of his people. The power of the church and the people of God today is not manifested in how strong we are, you know, how blessed or how rich and influential we are, but it is manifested through how loving and forgiving we are, especially in the face of suffering, persecution, and even death. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. If we were in the shoes of Elizabeth Elliot, or one of the family members of the 21 Coptic Christians that were killed by ISIS, how would we have responded? What would we have chosen to do? Let us ponder upon that as we bow in prayer and allow the Holy Spirit of God to search our hearts that if our loved ones were killed, how would we have responded to the perpetrators? Would we still reach out and respond lovingly in a forgiving manner? would we be able to make that conscious choice to still love them and forgive them so that they may know the love of God and experience the forgiveness of God that they may come to know Christ because it is only through us that they will experience God. Father, we thank you for the examples of these saints who have gone before us. Many who have suffered down the ages, faced death courageously. And because of their sacrifice, the testimony of the church and the gospel of Christ has gone to the ends of the earth and is what it is today. We thank you for your sacrifice. And we know that just as they have persecuted our Lord Jesus Christ, they will also persecute us, even as we follow Christ. But we thank you too, that the Holy Spirit, through the way that we suffer, the Holy Spirit will effect salvation and life forevermore. So grant us courage and grant that, Lord, there will be, even as we experience your forgiveness, we will be able to make that choice if and when that day comes to extend love and forgiveness to those who sin against us for your sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.